Tap on the mic and everybody gets quiet. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, let's get started. Come on and have a seat, please. Well, good afternoon and welcome to the session on community and military planning partnerships in support of regional growth. I'm uh, Rich Tanger from OEA, Office of Economic Adjustment. I've been with OEA for about nine years now, managing uh, base closure, <coughs> realignment, growth projects, joint land use studies, and uh, I can tell you over these years I've seen a lot of a lot of changes in how communities work these projects. And as you would expect, the challenge for most communities is the transition between planning and implementation. Successful communities have come together and met this challenge by creating permanent organizations to uh, carry out their strategies and recommendations contained in their compatible land use and their growth management plans. I have the privilege this morning or this afternoon of introducing three gentlemen who have been working very hard at managing and coordinating some very large, complex projects in their regions, and they're going to give you case studies on these projects. Before we start, I would uh, like to have everybody remember, first of all, to, that we are being recorded and that you should use the microphone when you uh, ask your questions and hold your questions until uh, the end. All right, so for our first presentation, we have Mr. Mark Merchant. Mark is the Executive Director of the South Dakota Ellsworth Development Authority, Rapid City, uh, South Dakota. He is responsible for uh, addressing uh, mission growth and compatible land use at Ellsworth Air Force Base. He started his first business at the age of 20 and has been active in economic development, corporate, and uh, organizational uh, development ever since. Mark is employed by West River Electric as the Manager of Economic Development, Legislative and Public Affairs. He has been alone by his employer to serve as an executive for several regional and state in initiatives. In his role as President of the Future Foundation, Mark has been on loan to the State of South Dakota serving in to, to help draft state legislation creating the South Dakota Ellsworth Development Authority, and then serving at no charge as his Executive Director since July 2009. Please welcome Mark Merchant. Rich, do we pull up the slides? Thank you. Uh, how many were in the morning session uh, upstairs? Oh, I was going to use that joke about the fourth husband of Zsa Zsa Gabor. <laughs> how do you make it interesting? Well, that's what our goal is today. We hope that this is. It is uh, a great honor and pleasure to be here today. I um, want to especially uh, thank OEA, uh, Serena, uh, Dave Larson, um, Jay Sweat, all of you guys that are connected with the OEA team, uh, we don't know what we would do without you, and it's an honor to be part of this discussion with you about uh, what we've dubbed installation and community integration, uh, the South Dakota solution, and uh, how we've progressed uh, through various OEA programs and into the where we are at this point. 
As Richard said, I am the Executive Director of the Ellsworth Development Authority. Uh, I am also um, very honored to have today uh, with us our Chairman, uh, Pat Birchall. Pat, if you'd raise your hand. Pat's the Chairman of Ellsworth Development Authority. He is appointed by our Governor, and uh, we have a seven-member board from across the state of South Dakota. And uh, also uh, with me today is not only a dear friend, but a, a very capable professional, uh, Scott Langeth. Scott, if you'd raise your hand. Scott is our managing director um, and in charge of multiple things, but will be uh, taking my role as executive director here in, in just a few days. So um, whatever I make a mistake, these guys will figure out to uh, explain to you later. Please uh, say hi to them, and uh, we'd be glad to help with anyone with comments afterwards. South Dakota, uh, home of great places, great faces. Uh, we often describe ourselves as from Mount Rushmore rather than Rapid City. And uh, one of those great places is Ellsworth Air Force Base. And the 8,000 great faces of men and women and families who live and work in the Black Hills and uh, conduct their essential national defense mission at Ellsworth Air Force Base. Here's the mission of the Ellsworth Development Authority. It is to make sure that our great state is always a great place for the U.S. Department of Defense to conduct its essential national defense mission at Ellsworth Air Force Base. Uh, to work hand in hand with local governments, the private sector and property owners to promote the health and safety of those living and working near the base. To protect and promote the economic impact of Ellsworth Air Force Base and associated industry and to work with the base and local communities to prepare for additional growth and missions at Ellsworth Air Force Base. Uh, did I already say it once? We're interested in more missions at Ellsworth Air Force Base. Uh, let me repeat, we're interested in more missions at Ellsworth Air Force Base, and we're prepared to deal with that. Uh, Maryland seems to have got most of them, but we'll take whatever Maryland doesn't want after the lunch session. Uh, we have a tradition of success uh, in South Dakota that crosses all our private sector public uh, uh, communities, uh, especially the leadership of our governor, the state legislature, and our, and our United States congressional delegation, working with um, other community groups uh, such as Ellsworth Task Force, and we'll talk about how these all interact in a second. Uh, then Lieutenant Governor Dennis Dugard and now Governor Dugard uh, made this uh, comment about the Ellsworth Development Authority and its purposes. One of the primary roles of the authority is to work hand in hand with local governments, the private sector, and property owners to promote the health and safety of those living and working near the base. Oftentimes we talk about economic impact as we should, but much of the JLUS process, air installation compatible use zones, and things of that nature are something just as important as how fast people drive by schools. It's about health and safety. And so we have incorporated that into our mission, and it's very much a core of what we're trying to do on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, then Governor Mike Rounds made the statement as well that South Dakota has an important role in working with local communities to prepare for additional growth in missions. Did I say that we were interested in more missions at Ellsworth Air Force Base? This authority will provide an important mechanism to deal with that growth. Uh, we'll talk about how this came up, but the Ellsworth Development Authority uh, was part of House Bill 1301, and as a reflection of the importance that Ellsworth had across the state, uh, it passed the Senate 35 to 0 and the House of Representatives 69 to 1. You never want a unanimous vote. We just made sure we had one vote against it. Um, what is the Ellsworth Development Authority? Many of you may ask that. It'll come up to later. It's an independent body corporate politic with certain state powers assigned to it by the state legislature. We are not the state of South Dakota, but we are, have certain state powers. We can borrow money. We'll talk about that in a second. Think of it as an LLC of the state of South Dakota, a limited liability company that operates independent of the state, but has clear ties to the interests of the state with certain definable missions and purposes. Ellsworth is an area of critical state concern, and maybe your base, maybe your installation is a local concern. Nobody would ever deny that. But the military impact on your state is a state concern. And part of the initiative to create the authority was about codifying what we already knew, that Ellsworth was important to the eastern part of the state as well as to the western part of the state. 
Uh, part of our role and this process that leads up to the creation of the authority and what we continue to do is to interact, as the governor said, with local government. Uh, Ellsworth Air Force Base is kind of unique. It doesn't lie within one county. It lies within two. Uh, you taxi in Meade County and you take off, I'm sorry, you taxi in Pennington County and you take off in Meade County. And uh, we are also have two communities that are dramatically affected by Ellsworth, Box Elder, one of the smallest communities but fast is growing, and then the second largest community in the state, Rapid City. So we have a dynamic of local government and how they interact in their relationship building, which we basically brought together in the form of the steering committee. And the steering committee has five voting members, the two cities, the two counties, and the state, now represented by the authority, but a broad section of collaborators, including the congressional delegation, private sector representatives, the planning departments and civil engineering divisions of the base, uh, and the Ellsworth Task Force and other contributors. This is an important dialogue that led up to where we are, and we continue to uh, pull this group together on a kind of an as-needed basis, but very much a part of the role of the authority to be an advocate, to be a communicator. Oftentimes, it's diplomacy, uh, but most of all, it's just communication responsibilities. One of the other factors I think it's important uh, to talk about is probably the role of the private sector. Um, I'm very proud to be uh, on loan from a private company uh, in partnership with a dozen other corporations who formed up a nonprofit to have an impact on high impact economic development. What you're going to see here probably has more to do with entrepreneurship than bureaucracy. Uh, we really did bootstrap um, an entrepreneurial public entity called the Ellsworth Development Authority as a result of real practical issues that we were facing. So the partnership has to include the private sector, and um, the private sector has really bootstrapped where we are today. We're going to talk a little bit about, and quite a bit of this goes back to our ongoing relationship with OEA, who's been involved with Ellsworth Air Force Base for a long, long time in various capacities. But in 1995, we did do a joint land use study. Uh, that was a, a, a successful endeavor. Uh, but it also left us with some gaps, quite frankly. I was just sat in at the end of an earlier panel, and one of the comments was, well, we did a J-Loose in 95, but it kind of sat on the shelf. You know, where did it go from there? Uh, there was some other impacts of that study. One was uh, we determined that we needed to move an exit on the interstate, which was dead on right off the end of the runway. That was a major investment made uh, by the state uh, to move that exit uh, down the road two or three miles. And then also tried uh, primarily for the health and safety of potential accidents that would have hit that, that intersection. But secondarily, it also, we said, well, if we're going to move it, let's make sure we move it to a place where transportation will enhance compatible civilian development, not contribute to incompatible civilian development. However, that great step and that big investment had a missing gap. Um, it's a little bit like water. Transportation is like water. If you change something, they'll find another way to basically route its way to uh, the Air Force Base. So we ended up with some problems as a result of actions that took place during our first JLUs. But many of these things um, began to be codified in a very, very important document that I would point you to. If you have not heard of the Compatible Civilian Development Near Military Installations um, document that OEA has available to you on their website, you need to get it. We found this document. It became our roadmap. It became our Bible. And we uh, printed copies of this, made sure that every county commissioner in two counties, every planning department in two counties and f two cities had this document, and it became an important mechanism. And in there, part of what we did in the 1995 study was documented as related to the moving of the exit. However, there's a statement here in part five of that document that I think is really important, and I would point you to it. It says, when the policies of a local government are su supported by a careful and deliberate study of existing and emerging land use patterns, government will be better equipped to make informed decisions concerning compatible land use activity near an active military installation. 
maybe seems patently obvious, but that is a great statement. And it became a big part of installation and community integration in the real world. In 2006, we went back to OEA and said we need to go deeper. We need to go beyond the JLUS that we did in 95 and find out some more pieces of the puzzle. And we were, uh, that launched the advanced planning effort of the moving forward with Ellsworth uh, Box Elder I-90 Corridor Master Plan in conjunction with the Governor's Office of Economic, uh, Governor's Office of Economic Development and our steering committee and Ellsworth Air Force Base. A core of that first step of that plan, of course, is air installation compatible use zones. Who has heard of air installation compatible use zones? Of course you have. What do they mean? What are the impacts? Uh, as a result of this document, uh, we basically ended up rewriting planning and zoning laws for two counties and one city. Even one of the counties didn't even have planning and zoning laws. They had chosen not to have those. So how do you deal with that? But we felt we had to codify and give a new benchmark for how to incorporate planning and zoning with air installation compatible use zones. We'll talk about those in a second. Um, but out of this study came this reality. Uh, the following outline provides a strategy and mechanisms for correcting the incompatibility surrounding Ellsworth Air Force Base. The mechanisms should be part of a comprehensive strategy that both regulates and compensates. These mechanisms should not be viewed in isolation, rather they are ingredients that are combined to achieve the long-term goal of preserving the positive economic impact of Ellsworth Air Force Base. The regulatory modifications presented in the previous sections of that report provide the foundation for compatible future development. But what about existing incompatible development? <coughs> you can't regulate that out of existence. You need to be prepared to be in a position to compensate. So out of that came a recommendation to create a special purpose development authority authorized by the state legislature intended for purpose of implementing a long-term sustainable strategy to protect the economic impact of Ellsworth Air Force Base. It was recommended the authority would be governed and administered by an independent board appointed by the governor. We have seven board members, four-year terms that are staggered. Now what that means is they're there, whether or not there's a governor, whether or not who's the mayor, whoever is in the county commissioner, there's an institutional model here to provide for continuity and whether or not your base commander is there, uh, which rolls over every two years. This entity was intended to have a long-term institutional role in installation and community integration. The authority would have the ability to receive or purchase property, issue bonds, take on other methods of indebtedness, to pay for the costs incurred with negotiation and the purchase of properties, development rights, sound attenuation measures, build infrastructure, and other steps necessary to maintain Ellsworth Air Force Base as an area of critical state concern. So out of that process, we came up with these types of tools, which we're now drilling down even further. Around Ellsworth Air Force Base, we established compatible action codes. This particular area, we need to maybe go in and try to buy. Maybe it's a mobile home court that's within the 75 decibel sound contours. We need to maybe find ways to relocate that. Uh, we started a process of a willing buyer, willing seller initiative. We said to the community, are you willing to sell your property that is incompatible? We started a documentation of willing sellers. We are a willing buyer. However, having the funds to perform on a willing buyer transaction is then part of any corporate development endeavor is you've got to capitalize yourself. You've got to find ways to do it and you've got to be creative in how you bootstrap your entity in place. And you start looking for various ways to do that. Um, one of those mechanisms we found out was there was some funding floating around from the Housing and Urban Development for Neighborhood Stabilization. Uh, South Dakota has been blessed with not a lot of foreclosures like other states have, and we ended up with some money under the Neighborhood Stabilization Program that would allow the authority to purchase land that had gone through foreclosure. This land, which is 230 acres, as you can see, lies just outside of the 65 decibel sound contours. As a part of our partnership with the city and the planning and zoning of the city, they had identified this would be a great place 
to build mobile home courts or to put mobile homes that basically were in an area that were incompatible. We didn't have the power necessarily to just go do that, but we needed to create a process for which we did that. So we were able to receive a grant, we did that, we bought some land, and now we're in the development phase of that 230 acres, and we intend to basically create their homes for opportunities for relocation of people that are living in incompatible land use areas. It's not that simple, uh, nothing ever is, but we know what our goal is, and like good business people, we're finding our way down that path to understand how to get there. Another element that OEA emphasized to us in some of the material that we looked at was um, what about managing growth? We are on a growth trajectory for missions at Ellsworth. Did I say that we are interested in more missions at Ellsworth Air Force Base? Um, you need a mechanism that will at, um, provide for adequate public facilities and services to those areas most equipped to accommodate expansion. So part of the structure of the authority and what we were trying to do was to be able to deal with that. Well, we actually had an existing problem. A base that was 55 years old had a very old wastewater treatment plant. It needed to be rebuilt. Uh, it was not going to meet new EPA standards. At the same time, uh, we had a community, one of the fastest growing communities, Box Elder, who only had a lagoon for its wastewater treatment needs. That required them to build a new wastewater treatment plant. We said, why rather than building two one and a half million gallon per day plants, why don't we do an evaluation of building one three million gallon per day plant? Well, that study, jointly funded from the state and the Ellsworth Air Force Base, showed that we could save $8.8 .8 million by doing one three million gallon plant versus two one and a half million gallon plants. That's your and my money. We didn't have to go to the mill con process to get it. It made perfect sense. The estimate, here's another little tidbit of why public-public partnerships can be very powerful. And I'll just say this very quickly. Although we're all interested in the economic impact of, of our military installation on our community, when are we interested on the economic impact we're having or could have on their bottom line? Guess what? They're going to talk about cutting a lot of money out of the Department of Defense. We believe that our, part of our partnership with our base is to help them save money. The estimate for building this plant done through governmental MILCON processes was $23 million. We found out later that the reason it, we thought it was, seemed awfully high to us, Scott has build, wait, built wastewater treatment plants before, his gut was that was awfully high. But if you're going after MILCON money, you've got to ask for more so that you have plenty when the budget comes in, hopefully at 22 and a half, you've got plenty of money. If the budget comes in at 23.1, you don't write any checks. Well, we later found out we really believe we can build this plant for 18 to 19 million. So the 8.8 .8 million in savings now became 13.8 million in savings. And then we could privately, the base could contract with us as a provider of bulk sewage treatment on a public-public relationship, and we could offer them a 20-year scenario by which we could hold down their cost for wastewater treatment. We think that adds to our base's economic value to the Department of Defense. At the same time, we also resolved a problem for our local community, which is now absorbing the privatization of housing, where we had 1,100 houses inside the fence. In three years, there will only be four to 500. Where are those people going? right where we wanted them to, right, into the private sector. Big impact on our local infrastructure. So now we had to do some things to make that happen. So we provided a mechanism to do that without any Department of Defense money. Secondly, part of our relationship with the base was also a partnership of collaborating. And they had two former base housing properties that in their mind were not in a key uh, slot for the future use. And one was the Skyway project and the other was Renal Heights. The Skyway City Center project is part of uh, a transfer of land that we will take that 53 acres and 20 acres of that is gonna go to the Douglas School District so that they can build a new elementary school. We will, with the balance of that land, build a new city center. 
uh, on this particular um, uh, diagram, right over here is basically a road. Right here is the fence that goes on to Ellsworth Air Force Base. Down here, about a block away, is the other fence that's Ellsworth Air Force Base. Right over here is the existing school campus. Here's where they're going to build the brand new elementary school. We want to put, through private sector development, a city center that will have enhancement to the quality of life of families that may be walking out of the gate here to go to school, but maybe stop here at their Starbucks favorite coffee shop or see the bank, or whatever else might be, just outside the fence. Why are we doing this? We want to be a great place for the Department of Defense to conduct its national defense missions. Did I say we want more missions at Ellsworth Air Force Base? That's kind of in the back of our mind. Part of what we did in our second advanced planning grant was also to deal with another important role that OEA plays, which is for communities that are determined to be defense dependent. Ellsworth Air Force Base is the sixth largest community in the state of South Dakota. There's probably more people within 15 miles of this civic center than in all of South Dakota. There's 800,000 people. Uh, we're, we're a big state, but not in terms of numbers. But uh, this is an important part of our community, and it's the second largest employer. Part of what we did with our advanced planning dollars was to look at diversifying our economy around a technology corridor and building on potentially the role of technology in associated industry of the military and Ellsworth Air Force Base. And 120 of those acres given to us by the base will be converted into a high-tech industrial park. This is an interesting situation here for your observation. Here is the main gate to the base. Up here is also the second gate and the Skyway project up here. So it turned out that when the community built a nine-hole golf course for the colonels, uh, three of those holes just accidentally got in the clear zone. If you read your AQs, not supposed to have that in the clear zone. So when we go forward, based on what we learned from our compatible civilian development Bible, we're going to move those three holes over here into the land that the base gave us. And we're also going to reroute this road so that we eliminate some of the commuter traffic that's been going up and down this road. All of this has been derived by the very important lessons learned through the JLUS project, the first one in 95, our advanced uh, planning project then in 2006. So these are all the things that we believe are contributing to installation and compatible civilian development. There's a lot more to talk about, but that's really our story at the end of the day. These are the people that we thank, those people that get in the plane, that get in their tanks, that get in their Humvees, or stand out in front of a, an installation somewhere around the world to protect us. Uh, we are interested in the national security of our nation first and foremost, and if we can help this customer do their job, we think it's going to be beneficial to us. So we'll look forward to opportunities to answer your questions in the future, and I'll turn it over to my colleagues. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Okay, our next presenter is Mr. Jeff Banto. Jeff is the Growth Project Coordinator at the Tri-County area that surrounds Eglin Air Force Base, the Panhandle of Florida. He, is a, he has been coordinating community response and mission growth and compatible land use at Eglin Air Force Base for over four years now. He oversaw the development of a comprehensive growth management plan and a separate joint land use study and is now responsible for implementing the recommendations that came from these studies through the formation of the Northwest Florida Military Sustainability Partnership. Prior to his civilian work, Jeff was an Air Force active duty officer with two previous assignments at Eglin Air Force Base, serving with both the 33rd Fighter Wing and 46th Test Wing. He then served as public director, as director of public affairs. He retired in 2006 at the grade of Lieutenant Colonel. I just moved this slide. <laughs> Is that the one you wanted? <laughs> There you go. To beat me up before I get up there. <laughs> you got 15 minutes. <laughs> no pressure, but the clock is ticking, huh? 
I want to make sure you guys can hear me. I, uh, we can hear one another really well up here, but I can't tell if you can hear back there. So um, that may be good or bad. Uh, God bless you for being here. We're the last thing standing between you and a cocktail this afternoon. So I appreciate, <laughs> I appreciate your, your hanging in there with us. And it is indeed my pleasure and honor to be here today. I wanted to highlight to you a little bit of where we are um, in the panhandle of Florida. You know, we're not in the dangling down area. We're in northwest Florida, otherwise known as God's country. Uh, or as some would call it, the Redneck Riviera or Lower Alabama. <clears throat> the three counties highlighted here, Santa Rosa, Oklahoma, and Walton, are really the focus of our activities, uh, have been to date and will continue to be. Uh, I am in Okaloosa County in the, in the center of, of all of that, and we're really the home to Eglin Air Force Base. Their zip code is an Okaloosa County zip code. Uh, we've highlighted that a little bit more in detail here just to show you that is the Eglin Reservation, a mere 464,000 acres of land uh, that bisects all of Okaloosa County um, and then uh, takes into account a large portion of Walton County to our east and a smaller but uh, significant portion of Santa Rosa County to our west. You can see a lot of the uh, um, small communities around here, Destin, Fort Walton Beach, and some of those. Uh, then you have Duke Field. What you don't see on this map, and I will allude to that, in about that spot, four miles west of Duke Field is where the Army 7 Special Forces Group is relocating with a new cantonment area under construction right now um, to uh, as a part of a BRAC move. And the focus of my presentation today will be primarily on the BRAC impacts. Uh, Choctaw Field uh, to the west of us is important because that's a potential training site for the F-35 Joint Strike Fighter and the, and the Navy variant that we are slated to receive. Duke Field will do potential training for the Marine Corps variant and then the Air Force variant will uh, do its training primarily out of Eglin. All of the airplanes will, will uh, hunker down at Eglin every night. They will, be, uh, they will reside there uh, as well. Also, in addition to all of this, I don't want to leave out the fact that up at about this area is Naval Air Station Whiting Field. Uh, also, to our west of Santa Rosa County is uh, Naval Air Station Pensacola. And uh, off in about in this area down here is Tyndall Air Force Base. So while we have focused primarily just on Eglin and the growth as a result of BRAC, um, we are truly a military-rich area with a lot of crossing of missions and all in our region. As I mentioned, the Army 7 Special Forces Group is coming to town. They're coming at a rate of about 150 soldiers a week now as part of a unit move of that organization coming down from Fort Bragg, North Carolina. We anticipate about 6,000 total persons and when you take into account family members and whatnot coming with the group. That is slated to close uh, September 15th. They're well on their way to making that goal. The F-35 Joint Strike Fighter Initial Joint Training Site is also at Eglin. As Rich mentioned, I was once assigned to the 33rd Fighter Wing when they had F-15s. The F-15s flew away about a year ago, and uh, two weeks ago we received our first F-35. We now have two of uh, 59 airplanes that will be assigned there. As you can see, three U.S. services involved in the program, plus uh, a, a potential for international partners. I put possible up there the numbers of airplanes and all, and as partners come in or, or perhaps leave the program, that's in a state of flux. But we do anticipate approximately 4,000 growth. Some folks have asked me, does that include the bathtub effect of the outbound 33rd F-15 folks? And yes, it does. We believe that our total growth as a result of BRAC will be around 10,000. To some of you in the Army, you're going, that's nothing, uh, considering some of the growth that has happened to some of the Army posts around. But to us in a county, of Okaloosa County that is about 180,000 and our three county total about 350,000, 10,000 is a big deal to us. Uh, as you can see, and I mentioned the 7th Group Contonement site and I showed you with the, uh, the laser blip on the screen very quickly, that's about $400 million effort that uh, has, uh, we've seen it to sprout out of the ground, quite frankly, uh, there. But in addition to the contonement site, there has also been a lot of construction on ranges uh, that the Army will use for training. And I would go back to this because the Army containment site is here, but a lot of their training is going to happen over here. And so there's been a lot of target construction uh, that has occurred as a part of that MILCON. And what that will do is shift a lot of mission around because uh, in addition to the BRAC moves, 
Eglin is the center of the universe for all Air Force weapons, non-nuclear weapons. Anything that comes off of an Air Force airframe is uh, researched, developed, tested, and evaluated at Eglin Air Force Base. So there is the potential for a little bit of mission conflict there. Uh, with the 33rd Fighter Wing now being the F-35 schoolhouse, uh, a whole new uh, construction project there, again about $400 million for new uh, hangar space, a whole new academic building that is the size of multiple football fields uh, and whatnot. A lot of uh, simulator training facilities have gone in. That campus it, it in and of itself is, is coming to completion. As Rich mentioned, we have done our, our two uh, study efforts uh, supporting BRAC. This all dates back to actually before I came uh, to the county and back when Rich Tango was wearing a Navy uniform as an active duty captain, um, but still in his role as our uh, OEA contact to actually kick off uh, our JLS and our growth management plan, which we tried to do concurrently. The timing got a little goofy, but nevertheless, uh, I put up here that our JLS was what I term a government-centric plan. And the reason I say that is when we're looking at execution of the recommendations coming out of our joint land use study, those are really items that your local government, at least our local government in Florida, have the ability to, to make happen through um, either comprehensive plans or land development codes or, or other regulatory means that we may have at our disposal. The growth management plan, as it turned out, really became more community-centric. And the reason I say that is we identified um, who is coming. We tried to project where they're going. Um, we tried to give some good ideas in terms of grades and earnings, um, how many students are going to come to the local school systems. But then it's up to them to try to figure out how to solve that for local developers or builders, for the school systems themselves. And quite frankly, some of the issues that we had thought were going to be larger issues when we scoped our growth management plan kind of turned out not to be and unfortunately, the economy lent a lot of that, especially in the area of housing. Um, you can see uh, two separate structures for our joint land use study. We had a policy committee and a technical advisory group, very similar to other presentations that have talked about how they've done their, their JLIS. Our growth management plan was different in that we had a 12-person executive committee made up of either elected officials or other community leaders in economic development or um, uh, the local college that was there, as a, for instance. And then we had 10 separate functionally aligned subcommittees. Um, and that really created a, a, a bit of a concern whenever you're trying to um, make all of this work sometimes together. So the way that the outcomes were for our JLIS was done by jurisdiction. Any jurisdiction who was identified in the study area, which was the three county area wide that I mentioned to you, had a chapter in a joint land use study that cut to the chase on here are your issues, here's the discussion of those issues, and here's the recommendations that our consultant provided for consideration of how to uh, resolve those problems. What we did further was we bundled those recommendations because some of those could be taken on in what I call locally enacted recommendations. Even though we're small communities and small staffs, there's some activities there that the local community could the local communities advised they could do on their own. There were other areas where we believe we may need technical assistance uh, in some of our recommendations. And then uh, the top bullet there talking about additional studies and analyses is very important to us because that really charted the way ahead for the next uh, uh, activity that we have undertaken as part of our JLIS implementation, and I'll touch on that in a moment. Our growth management plan in such a large area, it was virtually impossible to try to drill down in the same manner of the, of the JLIS when you're looking at growth management issues. So our consultant team uh, defined growth areas as opposed to the, the large encompassing three county area. We tried to drill down to areas that based on our analysis of existing conditions and the future potential for growth uh, had the ability to welcome in and accept those 10,000 people who we estimated were coming. There was one area in Santa Rosa County, the Milton area, which is up around NAS Whiting Field that I referred to. Uh, the areas in, in Okaloosa County identified there, and then there was one area in the northwestern part of, of Walton County called the Mossy Head area that we also identified as potential growth areas uh, that could accommodate the growth. As I talked about, when we had two separate structures with two separate uh, study efforts going on, 
We estimate about 200 people that were involved in any one time. Some overlapped. Um, my phrase here is too many moving parts. There were so many activities going on with that that sometimes folks had a hard time focusing on either which subcommittee they were on or was this JLIS or was this growth management and it created some confusion and quite frankly um, some folks kind of checked out after a while unfortunately. And so we may have lost some of the expertise they could have brought to the study. So what we did and this was a recommendation out of our growth management plan actually was to create the partnership that Rich uh, talked about the Northwest Florida Military Sustainability Partnership and we used our JLIS model in terms of a policy committee type of oversight structure with a uh, military growth advisory group as the local community input to that more so than at the XCOM level. Um, our executive committee is chaired by uh, a commissioner out of Okaloosa County Quite frankly, this is all done by interlocal agreement between local jurisdictions and our county. So for Santa Rosa County to be a partner, which they are, they signed an interlocal agreement with us and we agreed to be the lead on the partnership. Each signatory member gets one primary and one alternate member, but they only get one vote uh, for this. Um, the XCOM meetings are open to all comers because we are governed by the Florida Sunshine Statutes. And so everything we do is advance noticed and open to the public and the press. Um, the Military Growth Advisory Group is where local community members and folks from your Realtors Association or all walks of life that have an interest can come uh, participate. What is interesting here is we do have 10 jurisdictions and interlocal agreements and Eglin Air Force Base has joined by memorandum of agreement. They too have one vote at the table. And I find that interesting because in some areas where the base is involved in a community partnership arrangement where the community takes the lead, the base is kind of an advisor or in an ex officio capacity. Here they get a vote just the same as anybody else does, truly a partner. Our JLIS identified the need to better understand the long-term land use impacts in the military overflight areas, and this gets to our first big implementation step, which is what we call a small area study. The three counties that I mentioned, and in the northern areas of those counties are largely rural, unpopulated, undeveloped areas. Those are our future growth and development areas in our three counties. However, also under, uh, overlying all of that, and I think this map shows you a little bit better, is all of these are low level ingress and egress routes to Eglin. Along with this is a cruise missile corridor as well. Uh, a cruise missile corridor kind of comes in here as well. But this is how low level training can occur and how aircraft can come and go off the Eglin reservation. Those are key points for Eglin. If we don't maintain the viability of those corridors, this military mission suffers greatly. And oh, by the way, our local economy is dependent on Eglin to the tune of about 70% of our local economy in Okaloosa County. So that is why this is a huge, huge deal for us. And these are the areas that we have taken a look at. Um, this map is out of our joint land use study. We identified three specific areas of interest in our JLIS called military influence planning areas. One is about noise, one is about um, uh, APZs, and then the other is these corridors. This is called MIPA3, and it also encompasses a one-mile land buffer because there, there's sparse development here, a lot of uh, timber land, and we want to try to keep it that way to preserve the mission. So what we're doing out of our small area study is really, as I said, that's our future growth and development plan for our three counties. And so the consultant that we've brought on board to do this is really going to help us with policy tools to make this a part of our local comprehensive planning and our local land development codes. So it is really incorporated uh, in what we do for the future. And you can see some of the um, policy tools that will be provided there. Also regulatory tools. We have already looked at some of the ordinances identified as part of our JLIS process, but we are further refining some of those to be more applicable to the mission needs um, with regards to those areas that are largely undeveloped right now. 
We're also looking at a TDR program. We're not sure if that's going to work, but we wanted to put it on the table as something that we wanted to try to investigate to determine whether or not it is a viable option for ensuring that those corridors stay as protected as possible, as well as cluster zoning and any types of acquisitions or easements that may be available to try to, if nothing else, um, purchase some of the development rights or incentivize other uses, perhaps agriculture or other low density type uses that, that would not impact the military mission. The other thing we're doing in this particular study is we're looking at it from an economic development standpoint. Uh, one of our team members is the Haas Center for Business Research and Economic Development at the University of West Florida, which is our regional um, state university uh, in Pensacola. And they are taking a look at it as it indicates there from an economic perspective with the clusters identified, which are the economic development clusters recognized by the state of Florida. So in the event that there is any potential for growth and development in an in a appropriate manner that can help support the economic development initiatives in our state, uh, we want to try to be a part of that as well. Um, there will be other deliverables as are identified here. I don't want to take up any more time other than to say that this is truly our framework for the future, and uh, I hope we see that, <coughs> that formation one of these days, and I look forward to your questions at the end. Thank you, Jeff. I hope you guys are all writing down all your questions because we're going to have plenty of time. Okay. Our final, final presentation will be by Mr. Mark Sutherland. Mark has been the executive director of the Eastern North Carolina Military Task Force ever since, uh, since October 2009, responsible for addressing mission growth and compatible land use at Marine Corps Base Camp Lejeune and Marine Corps Air Stations Cherry Point and New River in North Carolina. Prior to joining the task force, he served at, with Marstell Day uh, as program director for encroachment control planning, and in that role, he provided a diverse portfolio of services to the Defense Department that centered on improving the relationships between military installations and their surrounding communities through the implementation of joint action plans. Also while well at Marstell Day, he led the planning effort for the formation of the Military Growth Task Force in 2007 and oversaw the development of Regional Growth Management Plan in 2009. Mr. Sutherland has extensive military and private sector experience in the fields of strategic planning, studies and analysis, and real estate development. His business experience includes over 20 years as a commercial general contractor and real estate developer. Concurrent with his civilian career, Mr. Sutherland's military career spans 32 years of both active and reserve service. Mark retired as a Marine Corps Colonel in 2009. Please welcome Mr. Mark Sutherland. Thanks, Rich, and thank you, folks. Thanks, Serena, for the invitation to be here. Uh, we had a short deliberation yesterday about who would go first and who would go last, and it was finally decided that we'd work our way from the eldest to the youngest. <laughs> Is that right? So, uh, so anyway, time, time gets to be a little relative this time of the afternoon uh, when this cocktail hour waiting on you, and I'm reminded of the lady that was getting dressed for work one day, and, and uh, she heard her doorbell ring, and she went to the doorbell, and there was a snail on her door. No one else. So she grabbed the snail and hurled it halfway across the yard, almost to the sidewalk, went back in. Didn't think any more about it, except for a couple of weeks later, same time of the morning, the doorbell rang. She went back to open the door, and there was that snail again. And so she snail said, what was that all about? No. Anyway, time gets relative. Okay. T time gets relative this time of the afternoon. So I'm going to hurl through this thing at lightning speed. Uh, I want you to catch some wave tops on it. If you have any questions, I want to leave a, a lot of time available for that. This is our region in green here. It's where uh, the, the southern outer banks you see, uh, nine counties represented there, all east of 95, five military installations in the Military Growth Task Force region, including Seymour Johnson Air Force Base. Uh, we also consider uh, North Carolina uh, Coast Guard sector 
and Moorhead City part in our region. They participate with us. Uh, basically all of North Carolina's military except Fort Bragg. Okay, um, here's where we came from. Uh, we founded a task force in 2007, not as a result of a BRAC action, but grow the force. Uh, it was projected that uh, 11,500 jobs or so would be added to the Marine Corps bases in Eastern North Carolina. That's turned out to be, uh, well, it's past that now. It's almost 17,000 new jobs. The family members uh, round that out to about 55,000 folks. It's a very rural county. Let me back up a second. This is a dying breed region here. I don't know that there's many of these left, and I've studied the country you know, pretty much in depth, especially in military regions. This is where rural America still meets the sea. Farms grow up against salt water. Okay, you don't find that very often. Uh, very rural area. Um, all, most, most all of our work to, to date has been funded by OEA, the state of North Carolina, uh, as well as local, local and private donors. Now that, folks, was the largest single job growth event in the history of North Carolina since World War II. So, as Jeff was saying, that means a lot, 10,000 jobs in his, his sector. Uh, we feel about the same way about that. It was like assimilating a new major city in two or three years, and it wasn't a BRAC event. By the time it was formally announced, half of the growth was already there, uh, and, uh, and the rest of it showed up within another year or so. So we did what everybody does. A regional growth management plan yielded an 800-page report that's some amazing reading. Uh, if you go to our <laughs> website, uh, identified 108 growing pains and 467 things you can do about it if you're of, of a mind to do anything about it. 10% uh, of them were project-specific, and let me explain that. You all know what I'm talking about. You know, the, the fatality rate in Jacksonville, uh, North Carolina, quadrupled as a result of this. The, uh, uh, EM emergency response times grew by 50% region-wide as a result of this. So a little help on the you know, million dollars here or a million dollars there, or an act by the General Assembly there, or an executive order from the governor there, a specific action will cure a specific ill in a specific locality. 90% of the threats, though, were thematic. They had to do with the region should do this, or the region should ought to consider that, or the region should avail itself of that. The region should develop a response, a comprehensive consensus response to X. Now, our problem there, of course, is we don't have regional planning. We don't have an entity that, that deals with that. Um, so, uh, so here's what we are. I told you about this very rural region. It is. They're all rural counties, every one of them. Uh, called that by the state. Uh, we know that we have a couple super highways coming. US 17 that goes up the coast, say from Wilmington up to Norfolk, will be a four lane high speed limited access highway. Uh, US 70 will connect Raleigh to the beach, same way, four lane high speed limited access. That changes the playing field. Um, the, you can look at the housing density changes east of 95 in our region and, and see that, that just the normal growth pressure is, uh, is alarming. Uh, this changes the game, these superhighways, though. So we don't have uh, any serious land use planning going on in the counties. Is Jim still here? Jim Jennings? Carteret County? Uh, they probably do the best job of it. Uh, but the existing development pattern in all of our counties is one of sprawl, okay? And it's incompatible not only with the military, but with uh, every other stakeholder group in the, uh, in the region. I'll come back to the developers in a minute. So a couple years ago, we said, well, who can we study? Who can we talk to that's been there and done that, that can maybe give us some pointers on how to approach this, this, this future? And here's some of them. We've done a half a dozen of them. But let me just real quickly show you what happens is, there's a laser. Right there, you find areas with growth rates, those are growth rates, by the way, over the decades, that, that the local growth rate parallels the, the national and the state growth rate until a point at which it turns abruptly upward, that tipping point right there in the green circle, okay? I could show you this for, for a half a dozen regions, but suffice it to say, they all look alike. They, uh, they go from a, pretty much a sustainable 1% to a 3 or 4% growth rate. And every time we found it to be coinciding with the completion of a road project. 
and the Myrtle Beach area it was US 5014 laning. And uh, Hilton Head, uh, Bluffton area, uh, Yemisee, US 278. And in Jeff's region, it was the Mid Bay Bridge, which I hope you probably can't see that bridge. That little two lane bridge, I was a college student at Florida State some years ago. We went down to Destin, it was kind of a village. You know, we could actually afford to go there and do what college kids do. And uh, I hadn't been back since I was a college student until February of this year. And I arrived at night and went checked into my hotel and woke up the next morning with a cup of coffee and opened up the curtain. And that's what I saw. I was, I was shocked, I almost fell down. It looked like Fort Lauderdale, maybe I came to the wrong place. And the shocking thing about that is this road right here, Jeff, tell me if I'm wrong, 1993, grand opening. Everything you see here was built after uh, 1993, okay? And it had an impact. It ultimately had a huge impact on Eglin Air Force Base. Anyway, let me move along here. It's not confined to places away from us. This is our own backyard, right, Tim? This is New Hanover County. Interstate 40 was completed into Wilmington, uh, 1994, that's when the tipping point hit southeastern North Carolina. And it's not confined to the, to the destination county. It, uh, it truly uh, did take two of our rural counties, Pender and Brunswick, and propel them into some of the fastest growing counties in the nation. All right, where am I? Okay, and all these locations are different, but they do have lots in common. Uh, the graphs all look the same. The uh, um, Major General Jensen, who's next door, right? He's right next door. Yeah, sometimes we tag team. A lot of times we'll tag team brief. He'll hit the 40,000 foot level and he'll say, folks, if nothing changes, your, your military will be run out of North Carolina in a generation or two. And he's not just talking about the Marine Corps. He means the military will be run out of North Carolina. Pretty bold statement and he's got plenty of facts to back it up, but he usually then flicks the booger on me and says, okay, clean up the details. So I'll get up and I'll brief, I'll brief these comparative community slides and say, now we have a model. We can actually go to Jeff's area and talk to people and say, look, 20 years ago, what modeling tools did you have? How did you know what was gonna happen to your workforce? How'd you know it was gonna happen? Did you know you're gonna lose 60 fighters? You know, did you know you're gonna have problems with one of your runways? Uh, or the watershed? Did you know you're gonna have to go two counties over for water resources? And they can go, yeah, some of that we had, some of it we did. In fact, Jeff, Jeff's area probably did the best job of all that we've studied in preparing for that. But it's great to go back and talk to the oldest of old timers and say, if you had that to do all over again, what would you do differently? And then we bring them back to our region and those comparative communities analyses that we do are, uh, are very helpful. Um, but here, here you go, uh, I know you've all read that already. It, it was a triple or a quadrupling of growth rates. Everybody knew that the road was gonna bring commerce and it was gonna bring growth. There was no modeling. I can tell you that if I go back and look at the state of Florida's projection for Jeff's reason, they had that 1% thing just going on forever because that's what they do. They look to the past and continue the line forward. That's what state demographers do. That's what they're doing in Eastern North Carolina, right, Jim? That's exactly what they're doing. Now we know that that's probably not the case. The workforce ends up moving away from increasingly from, from where the jobs are. Uh, you lose farms and forests and sometimes fisheries in the process, but especially farmland. Uh, farmers can't afford to, to farm there anymore. And uh, you either lose your military base entirely in every one of these examples, or you lose part of your military mission. Not all bad, some places have done a better job than others. So, uh, so what we decided to do was address that shortfall in our 800 page wonderful bedtime reading document and say, if there is no region through which to flick all these tasks on, we're gonna have to create one, all right? And that's what we've done. We've, we've put together all the people, sometimes they argue and don't get along very well, we decided to corral them in the room in a volunteer sort of way, not by brute force and don't let them go until they come up with consensus solutions, okay? Here's the solution. We created this thing called Planet East to fill that void, all right? And we bring in what we call delegates, okay? Equal number of them from local government, from agriculture, 
environment, uh, military developers. I got a couple of my Planet East delegates in here. Uh, Tasha Logan, the city manager over at Goldsboro, host of Seymour Johnson Air Force Base. Actually, the MSG commander from Seymour Johnson is one of our military delegates. Uh, Tyler, I think I saw Tyler come in. Also one of our uh, military delegates from Cherry Point. But we asked the nine counties to send us uh, one of their people from their county that speaks for agriculture, for local government, for the development community, both the real estate developers and the economic developers, uh, and the environmental and conservation groups. And what it looks like is we have managers and planners and elected officials and base commanders and, ba and military planners and heads of environmental, regional environmental and conservation organiza organizations. Uh, farmers, foresters, extension agents, you name it, okay? It's a good mix, and it was surprising to me that we only had them together the second date. This is what we do. We lock them in for 24 hours, and they have to get along, and we provide room and board and, and have them talk about things and find out where can we at least have consensus on the need to talk about gaining consensus. And it was surprising how fast all the groups here realized that you had to have a spokesman from each of those stakeholder groups at every table that was talking about anything because they all had a stake in it. So I'd like to, say, I'd like to think that, uh, that we're off and running. Okay, here's where we're going. We, we, this is my get out of town plan. This is my going out of business plan. As soon as I've uh, institutionalized this Planet East thing, our military growth task force will stand down and consider its work completed. Um, Leading up to an Envision East 2050 is a, a reality check. Anybody ever done a reality check exercise? Nobody? Yeah, a couple, a couple. Okay. That's where we want to, that's what we want to do late next year, and then we'll start the hard work of developing draft statutes, draft ordinances, draft resolutions from this consensus group to take back to decision makers, local state decision makers, uh, appointed and elected. Uh, that say we, the smart, reputable, experienced 42 people that represent all these things, agree on this. Has, this has to be done. This needs to be done for our region. And uh, once that's done, we're out of business. Okay? They're not. We have a senior regional planner and a junior regional planner that will be remain behind, invested, uh, nested in the COG, and the COG will continue to provide that forum, which, as I mentioned before, was the big void. Okay, that's it for me, Rich. Thank you, folks. Thank you very much. Okay, well, as promised, we have plenty of time for questions and lots of answers. Who's first? Please go up to the mic. I gave the mic to Mark so he could answer that. Uh, <clears throat> because if I remember correctly, he said that they're looking for new missions in South Dakota. <laughs> um, I will tell you from my understanding in, in talking with Eglin is um, there are already new folks looking to come there that weren't part of BRAC moves or anything else like that. So we have, um, we're hoping because our uh, partnership is relatively new, the ink is just dry on the documents that formed it, quite frankly, that that is the forum where those types of discussions can be had. Um, given Eglin's location um, and issues associated with some of its runway usage currently, um, that will be of great interest to the community in terms of who else wants to come to Paradise. But at the same time, um, we are not, uh, as a community, we're going to welcome them all with open arms. 
Now, the downside of that is that you got growing pains associated with that. So, uh, but we firmly believe, and that's why we institutionalized our partnership. Originally, our planning processes were all ad hoc. There wasn't a piece of paper signed between any entity. It was a handshake deal, and everybody kept coming to the table. And we're very great, grateful that they did. But uh, everybody was all into planning. But as we all know, the hard work really comes when you roll up your sleeves and start implementing. And we kind of had to tie them down by a document to make sure that they continue to stay engaged. Uh, we believe that is their good faith uh, showing towards doing that. And that's how we plan to work those future issues. Well, I could answer your question, but then I'd have to have Scott have to shoot you. Um, I guess the bottom line is yes, we are thinking ahead, and what do we do? I think the, probably the, former, the, the focus of this discussion, though, is institutionalizing what you did and creating a long, sustainable relationship with your installation so that you can be prepared for that next step. And you have to have mechanisms in place. It just doesn't happen. Well, it can happen in kind of a knee-jerk reality. Okay, somebody just sent you a new mission. What are you going to do now? We're preparing basically infrastructure and organizationally and every other way for that next step. And yeah, we are thinking about that future and whether it's uh, repi programs, whether it's uh, road development, whether it's schools, uh, whether it's how uh, we can take other excesses of our base and promote them. Yeah, that's part of the process. Yeah, some, something I'll, I'll speak maybe philosophically for, for a couple of seconds, and that is that, that robots really simplify the problem. They really do. You don't need as much space. You, know, you don't need nearly as much flexibility. So the sooner, uh, Serena, we get roboticized, the less, uh, less you, you, know, you know, horrendous your job is going to be. But uh, think, thinking about, I have a couple of installations in my region that would like to think they have a role in the future of unmanned systems. Uh, and yet there's not a lot of work be being done on carving out uh, any kind of airspace corridors that it would accommodate that. Uh, we need to get ahead of that game. The other thing I think we need to think about is that if, as we go to unmanned systems, they will necessarily reduce our ACUS footprints. They won't make as much noise. And so, uh, so we need to think perhaps about 20 years from now in our game plan just philosophically. Okay. Thanks. Good question. Hi, my name is uh, E.J. Gomes. I'm from Eglin Air Force Base with Jeff Fanto, and I just want to expound on your on your question too. Uh, one of the things that our local area does, um, essentially, all the uh, base commanders in the region once a year, they'll host kind of like. And Jeff, can you help me out with the acronym if you remember it? I don't remember exactly. It's the Base Commanders Council. Okay. Um, it, the forum that we host down in uh, what's it called on the island? That's the one I'm thinking of. Well, sorry, it really doesn't matter what the acronym was, but basically once a year, um, the installation commanders from the Navy at Whitefield and Pensacola, as well as the Air Force um, and, and some of the other um, smaller units we have there in the area, they will basically bring in the community, invite all the, the basically the economic development councils and all the other stakeholders in the area, and basically give them a heads up, an idea of uh, what the, the, the mission of the base is looking like that year, basically what their projections are, They'll get into a little bit about the acquisition strategies for what you know they're they're essentially developing, and uh, and with that it kind of gives the community an idea of where we're heading. You know, in lieu of that, it's going to be hard for you to you know kind of use unless you have some real high you know real good connections, um, which is surprising because another thing is some of your council members, I mean, I, I, they they know things before I know it as the community planner, so they're they're, they're finding these things out. But I would implore you that if you don't have something of that nature set up in your area, then maybe get a hold of the community planner in your area and kind of propose that they uh, host a seminar like that where you can get the installation commanders out there in front of your local communities and kind of giving the community that uh, level of insight into you know, the forthcoming three, four, you know, five year horizon. Next. Sir. Uh, Paul Somerville, Buford, South Carolina. Actually, I have three quick ones, I hope. Really cover the whole spectrum. Uh, Mark Merchant, uh, you talked about uh, a development authority. Um, I'm intrigued by that. I, I assume that was authorized by state statute? Correct. Yeah, well, how many municipal or county governments did you have to get to sign on to that to get it set up? I mean, couldn't you just <coughs> a bunch of guys say, we want one? How did it, how did it work? Well, there's advocacy from several 
layers. Um, I would say the private sector was probably the largest advocate. The business community uh, led the charge. Uh, then, obviously, we worked with our governor and lieutenant governor, drafted the legislation. We collaborated with the two counties and the two mayors in terms of what that legislation should look like. Uh, you, you know, we cut and paste to do that. Um, in in state government or whatever, you basically have one of three powers. Any state, one is police power, the ability to regulate, you know, have a police, all that kind of stuff. We did not seek that. We left that completely with local jurisdictions. I've seen some state initiatives where basically you legislate from the top down what are military overlays, those kinds of things. We did not take that stance. We said that's up to the counties and the cities to do that. It's our job to maybe help them see their way to do that, but that is a local government question, not a state government question. We did not seek any taxing authority. Uh, we basically created up, I said, a, a mechanism uh, to acquire resources to implement the planning process in a long-range way. And uh, one of the slides I kind of went past kind of quickly is we basically also admitted that the local government may pass one rule today, new mayor, new city council, might be a variance on that rule. The best way to permanently protect that particular area from encroachment would be to own it, put a permanent easement on it, walk away, maybe convert it to a higher and better use. So those were all integrated strategies. At the end of the day, though, we did have very broad support from all the municipalities and counties and all the legislative parties, but it was clearly a process and a partnership. Yeah, I think you answered my other, other part of my question. I misunderstood you to say that you did have borrowing authority. But I misunderstood you. We do have borrowing authority. But you haven't yeah. borrowed? We can sell bonds because we did retain one power of the state, which was eminent domain. Have you borrowed? We can. Okay. We have not yet. We're only two years old. Uh, we just celebrated our second anniversary. So, you know, we're just kind of getting used to each other. And you're probably going to spend that on buying development rights, I'm guessing? As we come up with money, we basically came up with uh, HUD money to buy some land. Uh, we're borrowing money from the state revolving loan fund to build the wastewater treatment plant. Uh, we've got, received other grants. So we can basically do a lot of different things. We could sell our own bonds and they would be tax free. Uh, all those mechanisms are within. Uh, if you want to go to Google South Dakota space LRC and go to South Dakota Legislative Research Council and look up 1-16J, there it is. Thank you. Uh, Jeff, you mentioned you were possibly going to a TDR program. Where it's one of, the, one of the topics that we're looking at, yes. You're just, it's just conceptual right Correct. now? Correct. Yes, sir. Okay. We, what we want to do is put everything on the table, and that was one of the potential options we wanted to explore. Thank you. And Mark yes. Sutherland, as I recall, there was an article in, I don't know, one of the newspapers I read regularly some time ago about the North Carolina legislature passing legislation outlawing outlying fields. Am I right about that? Did no, that come out of your area? Not entirely, Paul. The, legis the legislature uh, uh, deemed that a, a OLF w would be permitted only in host counties. That is to say, if you're the host, if you're the host to Cherry Point Air Station, you can build an OLF in Craven County. If you're in Wayne County, you know, you can build an OLF for Seymour Johnson Air Force Base. What was the political statement behind that? I didn't quite, I mean, I, I had my own theories about it, but I never did quite understand what the politics behind that was. Well, the, the politics is that the, there was an attempt to, to well, there was, there, was a, there was a movement to build a, a, a Navy OLF in a part, of, in a poor poverty-stricken region of North Carolina that had no military presence. They were all non-host counties. And, uh, and uh, the, uh, unfortunately, the, the conversation spun out of control uh, locally in uh, the General Assembly from all the, you know, representing all 100 counties. And again, only five of them are host counties. Uh, the consensus was, yeah, that's, uh, that's the business of host counties. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Yes. 
Yes. Yeah, well, the noise contours we have are basically off the runways of Duke Field, Eglin, Maine, and things like that. We don't have noise contours associated with those, um, and there are varying levels of traffic. Keep in mind that in addition to Eglin's missions, we also have Herbert Field, which is also in Okaloosa County Headquarters Air Force Special Operations Command and the 1st Special Operations Wing. They rely on those a lot for helicopter activity and, and things of that nature. That is all taken into account, and it's for all of those reasons, not necessarily noise, but just from a usability perspective that we are trying to protect those areas. And noise obviously being a factor. We don't want anybody who builds under there. We want to try to decrease that nuisance on a resident as best we can. This would be a question for all three of you, I think. Um, in the area of community partnerships, uh, uh, I've seen examples where alternative energy uh, as a topic has a uh, different meaning, a different priority, different solutions for DOD facilities versus potentially the community itself. As well, there's a third element in that, and it's, it's generally the local power utility company. Have have you encountered, uh, you know, the kind of um, uh, friction and, and dialogue in, in, it sounds like all three of you are relatively new in the process of what you're doing. So this may be a later development, but at this point, have you encountered it? Do you see any solutions? Um, interesting how you all showed joint task force uh, solutions where you brought all the stakeholders in. Um, can you speak to that point relative to energy? I got it. And I'll start it anyway. <laughs> yeah, that's a great question. I'm, I'm glad you, you raised that. It is a potential train wreck, I think, in all the host communities, perhaps no more so than those of us who live on the coastal regions. You know, the, the North Carolina's potential for, for wind energy production is along the coast by and large. Uh, although 70% of North Carolina's coast is no-go for wind because it conflicts with the military at the present. Uh, and I'll just speak about wind energy because I see it's a train wreck between a well-meaning community that's, uh, that wants to develop, you know, uh, an, an, it's an emerging economy in coastal North Carolina, uh, and yet their, their, their military is the second largest industry in the state of North Carolina, is the military. Uh, uh, are there solutions to it? Yeah, and meanwhile, like you brought up the utility, the utility's concern. The utility's concern is going to be a loser uh, for them, to, to tran to, the, the transmission of these things. I see uh, a bright spot. I think every time I see a threat, I, I, I look quickly around. It doesn't take long to find an opportunity. And in this, in this case, there are systems I've been exposed to in the last couple of months for wind energy generation that are a mere 14 feet tall. They fit on top of buildings and you can rack them and stack them. Uh, that takes care of the vertical obstruction problem with wind. And they're not, they have no metallic parts. And so they've been installed on airports already, uh, Westchester and uh, Columbus. They have an array of them on top of the, anybody here from Ohio National Guard? Got a stack of these on top of the Ohio National Guard building. So, uh, so that handles the radar. Uh, uh, problem perhaps uh, I might be speaking ahead of time but I see some real hope in that and if that's the case I think you'll see wind energy that's compatible with the military uh, being put in the community and on the installations and uh, and that that threat turns into an opportunity the other thing uh, that we're doing in eastern North Carolina is trying to preserve our working lands for a little while longer until the region can start to embrace land use planning adding value to agriculture by growing the feedstocks for the biofuels that the military needs uh, is an opportunity for areas like ours that has plenty of feedstock production capacity and a military that's thirsty for biofuels. One of the areas that I've asked our consultants to look at in terms of potential uses in our rural areas is exactly that feedstock uh, is one thing. Um, we're not a good wind area, so I'm told and our electric utility has told me that. Um, 
in all. However, in Santa Rosa County to our west, there is a little bit of personal wind uh, generators, little windmills at people's homes. I know they've done some coordination with Eglin as I look to EJ to shake his head um, and all. But we also have height restrictions all throughout all the counties that have been codified in code. So 50 feet is about as high as they can go and still stay within uh, the restrictions placed on it for where they live. Now, having said that, there's been some discussion about biomass um, activities. Herbert Field has a, uh, help me out, EJ, Herbert's alternative plasma arc uh, project that they've done over there. Okaloosa County provides the water for that, as a matter of fact, because it takes a lot of water uh, to do those things um, and all that. So, um, that, however, None of that has been done under the partnership that we've created because our partnership, new as it is, it has really been more concerned with implementing our plans to help support our growth as a result of BRAC and the military and um, has not interested itself so much in, along those lines, but I, I try to do them a favor and stay involved just in case anybody asks. Well, there's a lot to your question. and biofuels or renewable energy is such a big bucket, but let's just address wind. Um, part of what we, uh, just say this, this really kind of quoting Colonel Edwards, who is our group commander. The Ellsworth Authority is an advocate for Ellsworth Air Force Base. Uh, we are there to make sure that they stay there. Now, what that does is oftentimes it's behind the scenes conversations with the Air Force or with the local jurisdictions, for example, a um, lot of activity around small wind, and you have a lot of debate as to whether or not that little 14-foot turbine is really going to pay off in 50 years or five years. But a uh, big wind farm that has 15 to 150 turbines is a whole other thing. We sat down with the planner from our Ellsworth Air Force Base unofficially, I mean, back behind the scenes, and the Painting County uh, Planning Office and help them draft their new wind laws. How, where are they gonna allow turbines? Is it gonna be a wind farm? Is it gonna be a small? So again, advocacy, being aware, reading some things. Uh, through my uh, interaction with OEA, I met uh, the, the new director of the Energy Siting Clearinghouse. So we hear about somebody wants to put up 15 wind turbines between Ellsworth Air Force Base and the Powder River Military Operating Area we create a conversation between the developer, the attorney, the base, and, and the local planning departments to say where does this fit. And so it's really an advocacy role of helping facilitate. Oftentimes it's kind of like world peace. You're trying to bring all these parties together and see common ground as, as my colleagues are extremely experienced at. And, uh, but you know, I, I think as far as the local utility is concerned, uh, my company, West River Electric is a local distribution cooperative. They loan me to do this work. We're interested in the economic impact of meters, <laughs> you know, and so is my other sister cooperative or a power company, Black Hills Power and IOU. We're all, we're, we're in this together. We're both sponsors of the Future Foundation. So it, a lot of different pieces of the puzzle. You always have to look at the best interests of the whole and try to come to common ground and uh, renewable energy is uh, is is also new, and we're not really understanding all the implications of the economics of it, quite frankly. Go ahead. Do you have a question? Follow up. Yeah. You bet. Anybody else? Must be five o'clock somewhere. Uh, we got five hey, Rich, minutes hey, left. Rich, can I follow one follow oh, question on that? I uh, we we've been working. We've been working with, with Carl Jensen's next door. He's talking about what we've been doing in Eastern North Carolina. I'm sure we're crossing paths conversationally here. We've been working. He's, he's been adamant that why, you know, I have this great demand for renewable energy. Uh, to what extent can we glean that here in our backyard, you know, and be part of a sustainable solution to, enter, to alternative energies? And uh, same with regional food systems. How can we feed? Uh, 150,000 hungry mouths three times a day from all this vast food production that's going on right around our bases. Um, and so for about a year, we've been working a project called Food and Fuel for the Forces uh, between, our, between our Military Growth Task Force and, 
at Marine Corps Installations East. And that uh, Monday of last week made our first delivery of homegrown uh, biodiesel to General Jensen. He received it uh, on behalf of the farmers that, that, that produced it. And it's a start, and it can be done. And I'm telling you that 30,000 gallons a day demand goes unmet by them because it's just not available. So anyway, there is hope there that those industries in, in areas around the military can respond to that need, not only in a way that's good for the, your local economy, but that's sustainable and therefore it's good for our nation. Sorry, Rich. No, that was it. Had to, had to get a plug in for my. Any last minute comments? Was? <laughs> that was shameless. All right. Well, we want to thank you for your attention, for your, your questions, and for being here. And how about thanking our panel? Thank you. Yeah, yeah, I enjoyed it. I'll see you down your neck of the woods, all right? Good job, guys. Okay, thank you, too. Nice to meet you. Good to see you, Mark. Absolutely. Good, good to look forward to it. Is that on your website? Yeah. Uh, no, it's on theirs. It's all going to be on the issue. Oh,